Our first speaker, Professor Chris French, uh, who is head of the uh, Normalistic Psychology Research Unit at Goldsmiths uh, College. He's a professor of uh, psychology, and he is here to talk about spirits on the brain, insights from psychology and neuroscience. So will you please uh, welcome Professor Chris French. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that warm welcome. Uh, when we were planning this day, I must confess it did rather strike me that the other speakers had got the more fun topics. Uh, but, but Richard Wiseman assured me that it was okay as long as he got more laughs than me, so, and that's inevitable now, that will happen. There is a joke in my talk, so your job is to see if you can spot it. A little clue, it's I stole it from Simon Singh, so you may have heard it before. Okay. Um, Right. Recently, quite a number of commentators have argued that one of the reasons that religious and paranormal and supernatural beliefs generally are so common amongst the human species is because evolution has actually made our brains wired that way. There are a number of evolutionary pressures that people have pointed to that they say, would give us a predisposition to believing in the kind of claims that we're going to be looking at today. So, um, amongst those, I mean, one of the things that's made us relatively successful as a species is that we're very good at actually seeing patterns and meaning in our environments. And so, because we're so good at picking up on these patterns, it means that we're able to do things like um, take advantage of the changing seasons in terms of agriculture, uh, we're able to track and, and kill prey for hunting in, in evolutionary terms and so on and so forth. Um, and so we've ended, up with a, we've ended up with a bias towards um, making type 1 errors. Basically, mistakenly thinking that we're seeing order when we may be seeing chaos, rather than type 2 errors, which is thinking we're seeing chaos when in fact we're seeing order. So there's a bias, the, the argument is there's a bias there for us to actually see meaning and significance. And of course, there's a price to pay for that. Sometimes we may actually see meaning and significance when really there isn't any. And so, I mean, some of these examples I've used before, I'm sure you've seen them before. We have a very strong tendency, for example, to see faces and particularly faces of religious significance in what are essentially random patterns. I mean, this woman here uh, is obviously extremely excited, you can see from the expression on her face, um, at the discovery of an image of Jesus Christ in the burn marks on, on, her, on her tortilla. Um, this, this is a, a classic one that many of you will have seen before. This is none or bun, the immaculate confection. Uh, a cinnamon bun that some people think bears a striking resemblance to Mother Teresa. Now, if you can't quite see it, then that may help you <laughs> to pick up on that. Now, obviously, this may be one of the factors that underlies the tendency that some people have to see the hand of God all around them, to see meaning and significance in what others may see as actually being essentially random noise. Um, so that's, that's, that's one of the factors. We've got what, what Michael Shermer has referred to as this bias towards patternicity. We pick up on patterns, including some of the time when they're not actually really there. Another bias that we seem to have developed is what Shermer calls agenticity. Um, and what Shermer means by this is that we, we seem to have a bias towards assuming that when things happen, someone or something made them happen. Some sentient being was behind it. And the classic example everyone always uses, so I won't be any different, is, is that you, the, the, the scenario where you have the Stone Age man standing there reflectively scratching his beard and wondering whether that rustling in the grass, is, in the grass really is a saber-toothed tiger or not. Now, if you've got two scenarios there, one where you've got the Stone Age man thoughtfully scratching his beard and wondering, and another one where you have a Stone Age man who assumes that whenever something happens, there is some kind of agenticity involved, there is some kind of potential threat, and they get the hell out of there, 
One of them is going to survive to pass on his genes to the next generation, and the other one isn't, okay? So our brains have evolved to think in terms of heuristics, rules of thumb that actually favor us coming to decisions that will aid survival. They're not necessarily brains that have evolved in order to apprehend the way the universe really is. It's more about survival than it is about seeking truth. Um, so, what we've got then, say that those two biases I've already mentioned, patternicity and agenticity, but it's not just cognitive biases that, that lead to us having these predispositions. There's also very strong emotional factors. Um, and perhaps the strongest is the fact that as f oh, we are arguably the most self-aware species on the planet, and we are certainly aware of our own mortality. And that's something that most of us feel rather uncomfortable about. Um, the idea that when the physical body dies, that's it, that's the end of consciousness. The idea that when our loved ones die, that's it, we'll never have any contact with them again. Most of us don't like thinking about those things. And so there's a strong pressure towards accepting any kind of evidence for life after death. And what you find, probably the most pervasive and powerful of all cognitive biases, is the general bias towards confirmation bias. If there's something that we want to believe anyway, the evidence really doesn't have to be that good in order to convince us that that's the way things are. So the confirmation bias, driven by these strong emotional factors, will also mean that we have a very strong predisposition to believe that there is a spiritual realm, that there is survival after death, and so on and so forth. Now, these are all, I think, very valid and important points, but it's not going to be the main focus of the rest of my presentation. I'm going to start from the position that if we do have a, a predisposition to believe in these kinds of things, and indeed we know that these kinds of beliefs are very prevalent, then there also is a situation where very often people will have experiences which seem to confirm those beliefs. And that's really going to be the main focus of my talk. I'm going to deal with three types of phenomena in particular. I'm going to deal with uh, sleep paralysis, uh, near-death and out-of-body experiences, and memories of past lives. Okay, these are each phenomena which on the surface, people who believe in these kinds of things will put forward as evidence to show that there is some kind of spiritual realm, there is survival after death. I think that the explanations that science can put forward are actually better and we don't need those kind of spiritualistic interpretations. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to talk about sleep paralysis. And I'm going to start off just by reading you a couple of accounts just to show you how absolutely terrifying an episode of sleep paralysis can be. This is one from uh, one of my ex-students who used to suffer from these kinds of episodes on a regular basis, around about once every month. Um, and this is, this is one of her accounts. I'm lying on my back in bed with my eyes seemingly open and feeling just as I would if I were awake. I can see that my bedroom door is open and I try to turn my head to focus more clearly, but I'm unable to move. It is at this point that I begin to sense some sort of presence beyond the bedroom door. I'm straining in order to see what is coming and then she appears. She has wild reddish hair and is short in stature. She seems to glide across the floor, dragging her feet as she moves. I'm terrified. I still cannot move, and I know that she is going to try to kill me. She reaches the bed and climbs up onto my chest. She puts her hands around my neck and starts to strangle me. At this point, there is no doubt in my mind that the situation is real. She is really strangling me, and I feel the pressure of her hands around my neck. I cannot move, then all of a sudden I wake up but it's so difficult to remain awake that I immediately fall asleep again. And then the process is repeated again and again, sometimes up to 12 times in one night. This is um, an, an example that was sent to us by, uh, again, it was a, an academic psychologist. I assure, I assure you it does happen to non-psychologists, but, <laughs> uh, but again, this was quite a, a nice vivid description. This was a 35-year-old academic psychologist. These days, it's pretty much always the same. It's when I'm going off to sleep. I never have them in the middle of the night. I never have them waking up, always when I'm going off to sleep. 
what happens is my eyes are open and usually I get the sense that something in the room is happening. So it's more like apprehension. It's a sort of belief that something's going to go off. And then a shape gathers. A sort of small black cloud gathers and it's the devil, a monster. And it comes onto me and I can feel its weight and basically the belief is that it's holding me and that it's going to drag me down into an abyss. I can feel sensations on my body. It's multi-sensory. I can sort of smell it too. I feel sensations in my body like in a lift. I feel like I'm going down. I can't move, certainly. Well, I try, but it never works. Usually all I can do is to make a kind of hum in my throat and try to make a feedback cycle, make that louder. As it gets louder, the more awake I get, the more I can do until I can eventually perhaps shout. And that wakes me up properly, properly wakes me up. So you can see from just those couple of accounts, we've got dozens and dozens and dozens like that, of just how absolutely terrifying it could be to have that kind of experience. Now, basic sleep paralysis is very common. In our own surveys and in other work, it appears that about 40% of the population will experience what I call basic sleep paralysis at least once in their lives. And that means, essentially, when you are half awake and half asleep and you realize that you can't move. And there'll be lots of people in this audience who've had that, including, including me. And it's, um, it's quite unsettling, but it's not a big deal. Most people just think, oh, that was a bit weird, and uh, you know, try and get back to sleep again. Um, but in about uh, one person in 20, in about 5% of the population, there are some associated symptoms, some of the kind of things we've just heard about, which make the whole experience even more terrifying. Um, so there's often a very strong sense of presence, there's a feeling that there is someone or something in the room with you, and whoever it is or whatever it is means you're no good at all. There are auditory, visual or tactile hallucinations. You might hear footsteps or voices or mechanical sounds. You might see black clouds or foot black shadows or, or lights moving around the room or monstrous figures. You might feel as if you're being touched or if you've been dragged out of the bed. Um, they can turn into a full-blown out-of-body experience, and I'll have more to say about those later. There's also difficulty breathing. There's a very strong sense of pressure on the chest. And perhaps not surprisingly, there is intense fear. And you might say, well, that's a perfectly rational reaction to what's going on, or at least what's going on in, in your own head. Um, but people who've had this kind of experience say the fear is like nothing else they've ever experienced, even people who've been in life-threatening situations. And there's a good argument, I think, to say that the fear is an integral part of the whole, of the whole experience. It's probably an overacted amygdala that's actually causing that. Now, in terms of understanding sleep paralysis, we have a, a reasonably good explanation. We know that the normal sleep cycle, you go through stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four sleep, heart rate changes, brain waves change, breathing rate changes, etc., etc. Then you come back up through those stages and you go into what's called REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. And that's the phase of sleep that's associated with vivid dreaming. What appears during that phase, the muscles of the body are actually paralyzed, presumably to stop you acting out the actions of the dream. But something goes a little bit haywire in sleep paralysis, and you become consciously aware of the fact that you can't move. And that can be quite scary. And you've also got this kind of interesting mix between normal wakefulness, wake waking consciousness, you can see that you're in your bedroom, but you've got all this other weird stuff going on as well, which is presumably the kind of dream imagery coming through into normal consciousness. And the fact that you can't move while all this is happening makes the whole experience absolutely terrifying. Um, whenever you talk about sleep paralysis, you're contractually obliged to show these pictures. Um, these, these are by Fuseli from the 1780s. And obviously Fuseli, it's a fantastic depiction of sleep paralysis. You've got, the, you've got the nightmarish figures there, you've got the demon, you've got the pressure on the chest. And sleep paralysis does tend to be associated with sleeping on your back. But to be honest, if you sleep in that position, you're just asking for trouble. I mean, that's just <laughs> silly. Um, and ten years later, another picture from Fuseli. She's still in the same position. She's not learned anything. Um, one of the interesting aspects of sleep paralysis is to, although people in Western society t often haven't ever heard of this thing called sleep paralysis, there is a scientific literature there on it. We do need more research, but there is a lit extensive literature there. Um, if you look at other societies, they do have a label for the same core experience. And that label is typically 
one that involves some kind of supernatural interpretation. So, in, for example, in Newfoundland, they talk about the old hag who comes and sits on the sleeper's chest and suffocates them. In Japan, it's Kanashibari, again, a nocturnal spirit attack. In St. Lucia, this one's one of our favorites, very, very creepy, it's the spirits of unbaptized children that crawl onto the sleeper's chest and throttle them in the night. So, do sleep well, all of you, tonight, won't you? Um, back in the Middle Ages, they interpreted the same court experience as an attack by sex-crazed demons. Either the incubus, was the male version, or the succubus. The, inc inc the word incubus literally means one who crushes. Uh, the female version was the succubus. Um, I don't know which of the two of them looks more shocked, personally. You can, you can decide for yourselves. Um, but anyway, that's, it. that's sleep paralysis. You can see why that would lead lots of people to believe, yes, there is a spirit realm, and I have encountered it. I have had a direct contact. And certainly in the kind of more pre-scientific ages where everyone accepted that there were ghosts and spirits and demons and what have you, then this would have been the obvious interpretation for those kinds of experiences. Now, what we've got there is a situation where the person who's having the experience will believe that they have actually experienced the spirit realm. The next kind of experience I want to talk about is the near-death experience. And this is an interesting one because what you've got here is a situation where you don't think you actually have encountered a spirit. You believe that temporarily you have become a pure spirit being yourself. You've left the physical body behind. So we'll talk a little bit about this. Again, there's, obviously there's volumes and volumes written about all of these topics, but I'll give you a kind of an overview at least. So within Western society, the prototypical description of a near-death experience, and there's some debate about how typical this kind of prototypical description is and how much it's a product of the researcher's own frameworks being imposed, but we'll leave that for now. Typically what's described by people who come near to death or believe that they've come near to death and have a near-death experience is initially a strong sense of bliss, a feeling of well-being that like nothing they've ever experienced before. And then they report they have an out-of-body experience. During this out-of-body experience, they can often see their own body. They can see attempts at resuscitation. Um, in some cases, they, they report they move quite a distance away from the scene and they, can, they claim that they pick up information from remote locations. Often it involves going through, passing through a, a, an area of darkness and, and often a tunnel of light is reported. And they report moving down. This is a, probably the earliest artistic depiction of a near-death experience. This is from a painting by Hieronymus Bosch. Um, they, are often reported, they often report they're guided by spirit guides and that they enter the light and that they meet with spiritual beings, either deceased friends or relatives or um, even God or Jesus or whoever else. Um, they report coming to what they describe as paradise. It might be some kind of um, natural scene like this or it might be some fantastic city of crystals or whatever, but a place of, of great beauty and absolute bliss. And then finally, they often report they reach some kind of a boundary. It might be a wall, it might be a river, it might be some kind of, even a railway station, it could be anything, but it's some kind of boundary. And the decision is made either by them or by some higher being that their time is not now, they have to go back. And they return back into their physical body, often for the first time again feeling incredible pain now, if they've been injured in a car crash or whatever, they've had this fantastic blissful experience and then they're right back in the horrible nitty-gritty real world, and they're suffering greatly. Um, but you can see how this is a, can be a transformative experience. Near-death experiences are almost always positive, almost always um, have good transformative effects on people in the sense that they become less materialistic, they care more about their environment, they may become more interested in spiritual issues and so on. Um, there are reports of negative near-death experiences. They're, they're not as common. Um, three different varieties there. You've got one where people report something very similar to what I've just reported, but the person who is having the experience isn't very happy about it because they think, oh my God, this means I'm dying and I don't want to die. Um, and, and so they just, you know, even though what's actually happening seems very similar, their, their interpretation of it is they don't want to. Um, the second kind more or less corresponds to the stereotypical view of hell with 
people being roasted over hot fires and pitchforks and demons and so on. I mean, almost like a pantomime version of that, but people do, have, do report that. Uh, and the third version, which I think, for some ways I think is the most terrifying, is people report finding themselves in a void, a complete, empty, infinite void, and knowing that they're going to be there alone for all eternity. And that's the one that really gets me, I must admit. That sounds very, very scary. And obviously, the people who have those negative experiences don't report reduced fear of death. They, they report increased fear of death. Um, okay, so how do we explain what's going on? That's an important point. Are these really, as it appears to be to the people who are having the experience, some kind of glimpse of an afterlife, or so at the very least, evidence that consciousness, the soul, the mind, whatever you want to call it, can become separated from the physical body, or are they best explained in terms of what people have tended to refer to as shorthand, the visions of a dying brain? Um, I'm sure to point out, by the way, you can have a near-death experience even if, objectively speaking, you are not near death. So, you know, we don't fully understand what's going on. My feeling is that neuroscience offers a more promising approach to explaining it. We're not yet at the point where we have a definitive explanation, but we are beginning to understand the various components. One of the interesting things is that all of the different components of the near-death experience I've mentioned can occur outside of that near-death experience context. Um, and so in some of those situations, we know that what's causing the experience is some kind of unusual conditions within the brain. To give you just one example, because as I say, there's only a kind of brief overview. Um, there's something known as G-lock syndrome, or acceleration-induced loss of consciousness. And this is a phenomenon that can take place in jet pilots when they're doing certain kinds of maneuvers where the g-force increases to such an extent that the blood can't get to the brain anymore um, and you can actually systematically study um, the, the g-lock syndrome by putting people into centrifuges as shown in this picture and whizzing them around at very very high speeds until they actually pass out um, and then <laughs> i've never done it <laughs> sounds like fun um, in terms of the symptoms that people report when you do this, this is um, a summary from a paper by Winnery of over a thousand cases. And these are the kinds of things that people report. Um, tunnel vision and bright lights, floating sensations, automatic movement, autoscopy, that's where you report that you can see your own, a, a double of your own body. You're having an out-of-body experience, but you can still see your own body. Um, Out-of-body experiences, not wanting to be disturbed, paralysis, and dreamlets of beautiful places. Pleasurable sensations, psychological alterations of euphoria and dissociation, inclusion of friends and family, inclusion of prior memories and thoughts, the experience being very memorable when it can be remembered, confabulation, and a strong urge to understand the experience. Now that does sound very similar to certain aspects of the near-death experience, but we know that this is produced by lack of blood to the brain and therefore lack of oxygen to the brain. We are, um, we've, I mean, one of the components I think that is best to focus on from a scientific point of view with respect to near-death experience is the out-of-body experience component. Uh, not least because we can try and study out-of-body experiences outside of the context of near-death experiences. It's very difficult for obvious reasons to collect data on near-death experiences, certainly while they're actually happening. Um, but th there's more hope that you might be able to understand the out-of-body experience. And we have indeed made some interesting um, breakthroughs lately. Um, one of the factors, in very general terms, it appears that out-of-body experiences happen when the um, different kinds of sensory input, so visual, auditory, proprioceptive information, uh, telling us where our own body is in space, and uh, internal uh, sensations, um, and, and also other kinds of information. When that becomes disrupted in some way and the normal integration doesn't take place, sometimes the mind kind of solves the problem by telling us that we're having a near-death experience. So subjectively, we feel as if we are we are no longer located within our own bodies. 
Now, we know that the part of the brain that does this is the temporoparietal junction, and the, the most, perhaps the most convincing evidence that the out-of-body experience is associated with this area of the brain is that you can directly cortically stimulate it. The, um, the, the image there over on the right-hand side of the screen as you look at it shows that the area of the brain which, if stimulated, can actually make people have an out-of-body experience. So just by directly stimulating the cortex in people who are about to undergo brain surgery, uh, you can turn on out-of-body experiences on and off at the, switch of a, at the flick of a switch, which I think is quite amazing. And just in passing, because it was on the same slide, um, another phenomenon that might lead people to believe in some kind of spirit world is, is the good old sense of presence, which lots of people report. Um, and you can actually turn this on and off as well by stimulating certain parts of the brain. Um, so I'll just kind of mention that in passing. Another technique that's been developed recently involves, again, disrupting the in sensory integration, uh, this time using virtual reality technology. So you feed people false information about their position in space, and you do one or two other little bits of jiggery-pokery, and you can lead to a very strong illusion amongst people, that they're actually standing behind themselves, looking at themselves, or even, if you set it up properly, that they are shaking hands with themselves. So, you know, this is really kind of interesting and intriguing research, and shows that we are on the right lines in terms of trying to understand what this is the underlying psychology and neuropsychology of out-of-body experiences. Now, okay, how do we explain the fact that we've all read all those amazing stories and see those amazing documentaries where people claim that they picked up information that they couldn't possibly have known while they were having their near-death experience. Um, how do we explain those accounts? Well, the truth is that when you actually look at them critically, a lot of those accounts become less impressive than they first appear. I haven't got time to go through in detail, but there are, there's, there's good books by people like Susan Blackmore and various others on these topics. Um, and amongst the factors that might explain why people can have apparently veridical out-of-body experiences, where they appear to have picked up information from remote locations that was accurate, that they couldn't have picked up using their normal sensory uh, apparatus. Uh, Blackmore identifies information available at the time, prior knowledge, fantasy or dreams, lucky guesses, and information from the remaining senses. Then there is a selective memory for correct details, incorporation of details learned between the end of the near-death experience and giving an account of it, and the tendency to tell a good story. Now, all of these factors could come into play. The, the, the general kind of overarching model here to, to kind of try and explain out of body experiences is that all of the time you have an internal mental model of the world around you and your place in it. And that's based on incoming sensory information, internal information uh, about body limb positions and so on and so forth. Um, and you're constantly updating this as more information comes in. Um, but because these, this model, may, the, the information coming in may be ambiguous, you're also influenced by what are called top-down processes, your own knowledge about the world, your own belief and expectations and so on and so forth. And so in certain circumstances, Susan Blackmore in particular has argued that what can happen is, particularly if the, if the input is, de is degraded or ambiguous in some way, the model that you adopt as reality is one that is actually based more on imagination and memory than on the input that's coming in from outside, and, and therefore it doesn't correspond to reality, and you can end up having these out-of-body experiences. Now, as I said, my, my feeling is that we really should focus on the out-of-body experience as being the component that could potentially prove some kind of paranormal phenomenon. Because all the rest, all of the visions of amazing cities and, and wonderful paradisical landscapes and so on, uh, they could all, they're all internal, they're all subjective. We have no way of knowing what's, whether there really is something amazing going on in some kind of spiritual realm or if it's just, as I believe, a hallucination. The outer body experience at least allows the possibility that you could, you could produce some kind of evidence that something had happened beyond 
ordinary scientific explanation. So you'll be aware that there are a number of studies at the moment taking place with hidden targets up at very, very high positions in, on hospital wards. And the hope is, not the hope, that's a bit put in the wrong way. Uh, you don't hope that people have a near-death experience. But I guess you kind of do, really. Um, but the idea is that if anyone has a near-death experience and they float up and then they, from, they have to be at a vantage point above the target in order to be able to see what this hidden target is. And if they then reported that they'd had a near-death experience and they could now say what this hidden target is, that would be a very strong challenge to sceptics. But these kinds of studies have been going on for years now and no one has ever actually successfully reported any of these hidden targets. Another thing which I think is worth bearing in mind is that some people claim they can have out-of-body experiences more or less at will. Now, we only need one person who could do this under control conditions, who could have their out-of-body experience, toddle off into another room, tell us what's on the table, and, come, go and then when they come back, without having physically left the room, could tell us what are in these remote locations. So far, we're still waiting for that reliable, replicable demonstration. I know all about the remote viewing work, but clearly, you know, these people claim that they can have these out-of-body experiences more or less at will. We should have a, almost a 100% accuracy rate. Obviously, we don't get anything near that. Okay. The final thing I want to talk about is reincarnation, in particular, past life memories. And that divides into two subcategories. Firstly, past life memories that are derived from hypnotic regression, and secondly, spontaneous past life memories. So I'll, I'll deal with both of those. Before I do that, I want to make some general comments. Um, first of all, definition of reincarnation. Edwards says, it's the belief that humans do not, as most of us assume, live only once, but on the contrary, live many, perhaps an infinite number of lives, acquiring a new body for each incarnation. And Guili offers the following, the return of the soul or essence after death to inhabit a new physical form. Now, uh, I do find this absolutely fascinating topic, so much so that uh, last week I actually did join the Reincarnation Society. Um, it, would, it did cost me 500 pounds, but then I thought, well, you only live once. That's the joke. <laughs> and that joke will be reincarnated in future talks, <laughs> with thanks to Simon Singh. Um, right. Um, what are the arguments that are typically put forward in favour of reincarnation? Well, there are quite a few of them, and none of them are very compelling. Um, firstly, people argue that it avoids some of the problems associated with other forms of life after death, such as, well, where do souls go? Well, instead of having to try and find some place for them, you say they're just going to another body. But again, we don't have problems in explaining where the soul goes if you don't actually believe in life after death. Um, it appears to explain apparent injustice in the world, particularly by means of the, the law of karma. Uh, this is the idea that if you see someone who's suffering in this life and, you know, for, and they don't seem to have actually done anything wrong, why is that happening? Um, it's happening because they were, did horrible things in a previous life. I mean, I, I find this a really disgusting philosophy, personally, for lots of reasons. Um, but at the end of the day, the people who argue it say this overall everything balances. That means the universe is a just place. Well, I mean, basically, the bottom line is there just isn't any evidence. There's no reason to believe the universe is a just place. So, again, it doesn't really explain anything. And finally, it's claimed that it accounts for various empirical observations, such as child prodigies. How can a child know, be, be so amazing at music at the age of five? Well, because they were Beethoven in a past life. Um, it explains deja vu, apparently, that, that sensation that you've, you've actually experienced something before. Uh, that sensation that you've actually experienced something before. Um, you have to do that one as well. I'm sorry, you, you've got to do it. You mentioned deja vu, you've got to do that. Um, hypnotic past life regression, which I'll be talking about, and also spontaneous memories. I mean, deja vu is better explained in terms of neuropsychology uh, and, and other psychological factors, but I haven't got time to go into that. Right. There are there various versions of reincarnation beliefs. So in some cultures, um, people always reincarnate as the same gender. In other cultures, they don't. Um, in some cultures, you can reincarnate as an animal or even as an inanimate object. We all remember Prince Charles' desire to come back as a tampon, don't we? Um, whether there's a gap between the death of one physical body and reincarnation in another, or whether the soul enters the new body at the moment of conception or birth. These are all variations between different cultures. 
and the cultures tend to get reincarnated in the way that their culture says they should. So, you know, it does tend to suggest we're dealing with some kind of cultural product here, not a real phenomenon. There are lots of real problems with belief in reincarnation. Um, firstly, the fact that all the evidence tends to suggest that consciousness depends upon the actions of a physical brain, so how can consciousness survive without a physical brain? What's been referred to as the problem of womb invasion. Um, how is it possible for some form of consciousness to survive and all the memories and the skills that, that, had, that a person had in one life to somehow be imprinted upon uh, a developing embryo in, in, in another womb? Um, and the, some, the population problem, not all versions of reincarnation, but a lot of them insist that souls cannot be created or destroyed. There's a constant number that, that are reincarnated in, in different bodies. Now, this obviously would imply that the population has to stay constant, which clearly it doesn't. So again, this doesn't really make an awful lot of sense. Um, so dealing first with hypnotic past life regression, um, one of the classic cases which generated a lot of interest was the case of Bridie Murphy, which became the subject of a best-selling book back in the 19, 1956, in fact. Um, and this is how uh, Terence Hines describes the case in his, in his book. He says, in 1952, one Virginia Tye was hypnotized. She reported details of a previous life in Cork, Ireland, as Bridie Murphy. While hypnotized, she's an American woman, while hypnotized, she spoke in a distinct Irish accent uh, that she did not have normally and described her life in Cork in great detail. Her case was reported as proof of reincarnation in Bernstein's best-selling book, The Search for Bridie Murphy. That was subsequently made into a film as well. You may have seen it. Um, it did generate a lot of interest at the time. Apparently, uh, there, was a, there, was a, there was a hit pop record based on on this case, and there, were also, there was also a fad of having come-as-you-were parties, which I thought was a great idea, I love that. Um, the case was thoroughly investigated several years later. It was discovered that as a child, Mrs. Ty had a neighbor across the street who had grown up in, uh, my eyesight is terrible, had grown up in Ireland and used to tell her stories about, these, about her life there. Uh, the woman's maiden name, you guessed it, Bridie Murphy. Further, it was revealed that Mrs. Ty had been involved in theatre in high school and had learned several Irish monologues, which she had delivered in what her former teacher referred to as a heavy Irish brogue. So, you know, the, the idea here is that she was... I mean, I'm not going to say put an act on, because that makes it sound like she was deliberately faking, but there's something about going through a hypnotic induction procedure and trying to deliver what you think is required. And if you're a very imaginative person people could end up kind of with these apparent memories that they think are, are true memories of something that really happened to them, and they're not, they're false memories. I remember seeing a documentary, 1977 I think it was, called The Bloxham Tapes, about reincarnation, and I found it totally convincing. I used to be a believer in those days, I'm sorry. Um, Arnold Bloxham's a Cardiff-based hypnotherapist. He used to record his sessions, and he would use hypnotic regression to take people back, apparently, into past lives. And he had lots of really interesting cases. You usually find with these cases that they, the people concerned can't remember very much detail, uh, but, what, but he, I mean, what they do remember tends to correspond to the kind of Hollywood version of life in that era, rather than the historically accurate version of life in that era. But he had some really interesting cases which did have a lot of detail, and it seemed to, by and large, check out. Um, one of his star cases, it was, just, it was featured in the documentary, um, do documentary narrated by Magnus Magnusson, so it had to be true. Um, and, a, and a, a book written by Jeffrey Iverson. One of his star cases was a woman that he referred to as Jane Evans, a Welsh housewife, and she had at least six different past lives that he had a lot of detail on, uh, including that she was a maid in the house of a 15th century French nobleman, Jacques Coeur. She could describe the house in minute detail down to ornaments on the mantelpiece. She knew all about his business affairs and various other aspects of his life. Um, and also she described life in Roman Britain, um, again, uh, in lots of detail. Uh, superficially, this looked like a really, really compelling case, I have to say. Um, but it was when uh, Melvin Harris did some research and chased up to try and find the explanation, he found that um, 
there were some interesting discrepancies between the historical record and what Jane Evans was claiming. Uh, so, for example, Jacques Coeur, although she insisted he was single and had no family, in fact, the historical record show quite conclusively he was married and he had kids, the kind of thing that most maids would notice. Um, and uh, th this provided the clue to the explanation. Um, it turns out there was a historical novel written about him called The Money Man by uh, Thomas Costain. And Costain had just taken the literary liberty of getting rid of the wife and kids because they were getting in the way of plot development. So he'd written the story without the central character being married, where the historical records showed that he was. Um, presumably... Jane Evans had read the book, remembered all the details, and then during the therapy, during the hypnotic regression, they were coming up again, and she thought they were real memories. Similarly, the life in Roman Britain that she reported, she not only included the real historically accurate characters that were around at the time, but also, again, there was a novel, historical novel about this, um, uh, called The Living Wood, that, and certain, some of the characters were fictional, just made up to help the plot along, and they were in her recollections as well, the fictional characters. So, um, uh, with respect to the uh, details of the ornaments on the mantelpiece for the French nobleman, it turns out this is one of the most photographed houses in France, so anybody with an interest in history could easily have found some book in the library and studied those pictures. The idea is that most people believe she wasn't actually deliberately lying. It's what the people refer to as cryptamnesia, literally hidden memories. You can take in the information and forget where it's come from, but then it bubbles up in this kind of false memory, con in this kind of um, hypnotic trance context, and uh, it's taken as being real memories. The late Nick Spanos did some interesting experimental studies. He found that fantasy-prone people are particularly likely to report detailed accounts of past lives. Um, he argued, and I agree with him, that the narratives are based on imagination, fantasy, expectation, and knowledge, and it's often the Hollywood version. You even get cases of people, when, if you ask them, people, what's the date, you know, what's, what's the currency in your country? Is your country at war? Who is the ruler? Then obviously, if people were really reliving that time, they would know those things, and they typically don't. You even sometimes get cases of people being asked what the date is, and they'll say it's uh, 50 BC. Think about it. <laughs> Um, I'm going to shoot through this a little bit because I'm aware that time's getting on and we want to hear from Hayley. Um, the, the second category of, of, of cases are those which are more, in some ways more challenging, certainly kind of very interesting from a psychological point of view, people who have spontaneous memories of past lives, no hypnosis involved. Um, the, well, okay. Um, the person who's probably done more to study these kind of cases than anyone else was the late uh, Professor Ian Stevenson. He devoted his life, basically, to going around the world collecting these cases. And if you read them, they are superficially very impressive. You seem to have cases where kids in Sri Lanka, India, Pakistan, other areas around the world are reporting, remembering things that happened to them in a past life and then they find who the person they think it must be the reincarnation of, and the details seem to correspond to an amazing extent. Uh, and, and certainly they're very intriguing cases. I'm not convinced by them, and, and part of the reason I'm not convinced by them is uh, a documentary I took part in many years ago now, where we went to Lebanon to look at reincarnation claims amongst the Druze. The Druze are a particular religious sect. Um, and... Without going into the detail, we had kind of, because we were taking part in a TV program, we had lots of access to things we wouldn't normally have had access to, including in one particular school, there were lots of kids who claimed to have past life memories. Now, the, the Druze believe that everybody is reincarnated, but you only remember it if you met a violent or untimely death. Um, and of course, with the Civil War, there were lots and lots of violent deaths. So one particular school we heard about where there were lots of kids who claimed they had these past life memories, and they very kindly got them all together in one classroom for us. So this was rather weird. This is a, this is a room full of kids who all claim that they can remember a past life, um, which is really weird. If you ever get a chance to see the documentary, it's one of the, one of the few programs I've taken part in that I'm quite proud of. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, you, 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 we're working through a translator, obviously, but you get these kids talking there very matter-of-factly about the day that they were driving along in their Jeep and it was hit by a shell, and then they died, and then they were born to this body. You know, they're, they're, there's no big deal. They're not bothered about it. Every, it happens to everybody, but just so happens they can remember it. Um, anyway, they're, they're the kids in the school. 
Um, there was a, that we worked out, there were about 21 kids there, we worked out that was about 2% of all the kids in the school, the 1 50th. If you multiply that about the, across the entire Druze population, if that's representative, you've got a very high number of kids who actually appear to remember these past lives. But what we found was that when we started to try and investigate, a lot of the memories were so vague that you couldn't even really check up on something. You know, there were no names, there were no details, you couldn't possibly try and cross-check to see whether a person corresponding to those memories really did exist. Um, we did find, so that, that really dwindled the number that where we had some very fi where we had some details that we could potentially check. Um, what we then found was that when you actually started to check, most of the cases just didn't check out. Um, okay, so I'll give you a few examples. We had one little kid called Rami Abu Aram, who claimed to have been Rami, Rami's Haidar in a previous life and to have driven a Pepsi truck to and from the depot in Beirut. We went down to the depot and nobody had heard of him, including a supervisor who had worked there for, for, for many decades. So as far as we know, this guy just didn't exist. It was, it was a false memory. We don't know where it came from, but it didn't correspond to reality. We had a little kid called Mehdi Hibous, who um, claimed in his past life that he was Mele Melerb and that he'd been killed by a shell while digging with a tractor. And he gave the names of his wife and children um, and we found, well, upon checking, that there had been a Mele Melerb and he had died in the way described, but the name of the wife and kids just didn't correspond. Our, our Druze guide, who was a complete believer in reincarnation, said, well, maybe he wasn't really Mele Melerb, maybe he was a close friend of Mele Melerb, and he's just got confused, because when you die, it does confuse you, apparently. Um, and that, that really, you know, he thinks he was Mele Mele, but he really wasn't. So, I mean, again, if you want to, you can try and make evidence out of really poor quality data, but we weren't convinced. And things got really bad because when we contacted Mele Mele's family, they said, oh, no, he can't be the reincarnation. <laughs> we already know who the reincarnation is. <laughs> so, clearly, at least one of them had false memories. Um, now, why are these cases important, these cases that don't pass the test? Well, I think they are very important because they, they provide the correct context for weighing up the rest of the cases. If you were to look at how well a psychic performed by only looking at the hits and ignoring the, much, the many more numerous misses, you'd get a very distorted view. If you look at Ian Stevenson's cases, they are the tip of a very large mountain, and most of the cases don't even begin to check out. Obviously, you, if, you, if you've got loads and loads and loads of cases that you look at, and you just take the very best ones, they're gonna look quite impressive, taken in isolation, but that's quite misleading, I think. Um, these, also, these cases also provide evidence for the fact that reincarnation claims a pervasive aspect of Druze culture, and finally, it shows that at least some of the Druze reincarnation claims are false. Um, and those cases are likely to range from pure fantasy to a mix of real memories and information from other sources and so on and so forth. But it establishes that some of them are false, so the burden of proof is on the people who are saying, well, some of them aren't to prove that they aren't. We know that the vast majority are false memories. I suspect they all are. Um, one case that we focused on was little Rabia Abu Dayab, who was a very appealing little kid. There's, there's me with no grey hair. Look at that. Um, if he'd have turned up on my doorstep and said he was the reincarnation of some dead member of my family, I'd have taken him in. He was lovely. Um, anyway, he, he claimed, wait for it, that in the past life, he was not only an international footballer, but also a successful pop star. And you can imagine my reaction was, oh, yeah, right. But it turns out, in fact, that this guy really did exist. His name was Saad Halawi, and of course, because he was such a celebrity, there was loads of information around about him. There were magazine articles, he was always on the TV. He, he had died a very tragic death. He'd kind of given in, up his life of celebrity to fight for his country and so on and so forth. Um, but he was, he was, he was you know, hugely popular. Turns out the, his, uh, little Rabia's mother was a huge fan even before he was born. So there were all kinds of ways that this informa the information that he had in these false memories could have, could have come to him. Um, that's pretty much what I just said, yeah. Okay, in terms of possible explanations for what's going on with these cases, um, what I, I'm not going to read that lot out. Um, the way that these cases are usually described is that um, when... The, the, pair, the child first begins to speak, they'll, it, this, is, this is the account the Druze tend to give. It's fairly, 
fairly stereotypical. When the child first begins to speak, they'll, say thing, they'll start saying things that are a bit weird, like, you know, my name's not X, it's Y, or you're not my mother, you're, my mother is so-and-so, or, you know, they'll drive past a factory and they'll say that I used to be the boss in that factory, weird stuff like that, and the parents will eventually realize that these must be past life memories. And initially, um, the parents will not do anything about it, but the child will insist that contact is made with their past life family. And so a meeting will be arranged. The past life family will initially not accept the child. They'll, in fact, they'll try and test the child, or maybe even try and trick them. They'll look through photograph albums and say, oh, look, there's Uncle So-and-so. And the child will say, no, that's not Uncle So-and-so. That's Uncle So-and-so. This is Uncle blah, blah. And the child's always right, obviously. And they'll even have kind of little themes that crop up time again of maybe the child going over to a, to a cupboard and removing the false bottom of the cupboard that nobody knew was there and the family jewellery had been hidden there. And you know, How could they possibly know unless it really is a reincarnation? And they insist they don't give anything away. Now, um, I suspect that's not how it really happens at all. Um, what ha in a culture where reincarnation is accepted as the norm, then if a child says anything that's a bit unusual, people, the, the parents are likely to interpret it as possibly evidence for a past life. And they're going to start thinking about well, who, who could the, the, person, the reincarnated person have been. Um, the parents, as I say, will, will eventually kind of settle on some... You know, maybe maybe put somebody in the next village who died in a particular way or had a particular job. And then they'll probably try and probe with the child and say, you know, do you remember that you, know, you used to do such and such a thing or whatever? And they're, they're inadvertently feeding the child. The child's taking this in. Nobody's deliberately trying to fool anybody. Um, but it's a, it's a kind of context where false memories could actually form. Um, there's a very high level of marriage within the extended family amongst the Druze, because Druze are not supposed to marry non-Druze, and deaths are publicly announced in all of the villages. So there's lots of possible sources for information transfer. Um, when these meetings have been arranged between the, the initial meeting between the past life family and the biological family, again, if the past life family accepts the child as a genuine reincarnation, then the, 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 the sources of, of information transfer obviously increase greatly. There'll be photograph albums, there'll be all kinds of stories about things that happened in the past and so forth. Um, sorry, I'm rushing this a little bit because I'm aware of the time. Um, Okay, yes, I've just said all that. Okay, so just summarize that little section then. Most children do, that don't claim to have remember past lives, of those that do, most are unable to provide checkable details. Of those that can, most of the details are untrue. The few cases where it's claimed that a large amount of detail was recalled and verified are all cases in which the past life family accepted the claimant as a genuine reincarnation many years before. So the chances are that what we're actually dealing with is, is memories that have been embellished, the, the stories got better in the retelling, and so on and so forth. We know that that's the way that human memory works. Um, so just to, just to conclude then, um, although on the surface these different various phenomena might appear to offer support for the existence of some kind of spirit realm, I would argue that we're better to try and think of these things in terms of scientific explanations. And uh, again, probably the best way to end a talk like this is with a quotation from Professor C.D. Broad, who commented, I think I may say that for my part, I should be slightly more annoyed than surprised if I should find myself in some sense persisting immediately after the death of my present body. One can only wait and see, or alternatively, which is no less likely, wait and not see. Okay, thank you very much for listening.